Good morning. It's nice to see uh, many familiar faces. I'm doing what I did in the eight o'clock. I'm just scanning because I know people sit in the same seats like year after year. So I'm doing a bit of a roll call to check who's still around from seven years ago sitting in the same spot. And I can see some of you are very comfortable in your wing still. Uh, some of you haven't moved for like seven years. Sure, they're going to have to dust you off and roll you out of here one day. That's wonderful. Here from the no, this is the English church. <laughs> no, I know, I'm just teasing you. I know what you're saying. I don't, think, I don't know if people are here from the Spanish church. Anyone? Spanish church. Oh, okay, there's, I'm sure there's a few people lurking around. You guys can all have a little congregation in the front here. The, <laughs> Reunion of the Spanish crowd. If you don't know what they're talking about, like that's a building like a very a while, long time ago when the church in its infancy, I think. So, but it's 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 great to be back. We're loving. Whoops, sorry. We're loving uh, the season at Parkhurst, and so bring a lot of love from uh, the church there. Uh, we're enjoying most of it, and uh, it's been yeah seven years. It's been quick, and it's felt long at both at the same time. And uh, we owe a great debt to Rosebank uh, to help in Parkhurst get going. And uh, so you know, we're mindful of that. And uh, so they send much love while they're meeting this morning and sent me over here uh, to be with you this morning. Uh, if you have a Bible or a phone or something, don't you want to open it up to uh, Joshua chapter 24? We, uh, <clears throat> we're going to be looking just at a couple of verses out of a longer uh, passage this morning uh, at this family service. So head towards Joshua chapter 24 verse 14 um, as you're looking. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if you've ever thought of, of how many choices you have to make every day. How many do you think you have to make every day? If you, uh, if you asked Google which is pretty standard practice these days, Google will tell you it's somewhere between 27 and 35,000. Now, I don't know who has to make 35,000 choices a day. I wouldn't want the com complexity of their life. I don't quite know how they get that number because that's a lot every minute. Um, I, have <clears throat> I have three kids in our home. Uh, we have a sort of almost 13-year-old, 11-year-old, and a 5-year-old. And I can tell you that before seven o'clock in the morning, we have had to make probably north of between 500 and 1,000 choices, whether it's eggs or oaties or toast, you know, whether to brush your teeth or not, whether to get dressed or changed or finding uh, whether to wear shoes or slops or, you know, I'm busy making a whole bunch of decisions around whether I should keep these children or sell them to defray <laughs> expenses. You know, there's a lot of choice going on in our home before seven o'clock in the morning. Um, it's wild, it's chaotic, and it's a wonderful season of life. But not all the choices that we have to make in a day are equally important, are they? It, it doesn't really matter whether you have toast or eggs. For, the most, for most people, for the most part, it's like a minor decision in the bigger scheme of things. Some decisions that you make radically affect your now and your forever. And I want to look at a passage of scripture today that makes us zero in on what you can call a decision day. Uh, you see these scattered throughout the scriptures where God calls his people to a decision day. And he eyeballs them and he lines them up and he says, look, you need to choose here. I'm reminding you of a choice. I'm giving you some options. And uh, just before we dive into this uh, passage, let me give you some of the context in case you find yourself a bit uh, at a loss for the bearings of where we are in the bigger scheme of the story. God has rescued his people out of Egypt. He's delivered them from slavery there. Done amazing things to do that. And they've bailed on their responsibility to go into the land God had promised them. And so they end up wandering around in the desert for a while. And they come back and then get the act together, cross over the Jordan. They, cro they, they uh, take Jericho. I mean, the kids remember that story when they walk around and the walls fall down. They take Jericho. They start to settle in the land God's given, given them. They're moving out and, and spreading out. And this is sort of 
where we get to in the story here. Joshua, who's taken over the leadership of the nation from Moses, uh, is now, he's close on 110 years old. He's a belly now. This is the last thing that Joshua does, is call the nation together and say, look here, you've had to choose and recommit and recovenant along the way. He's asking them to do it again. This is in some ways Joshua's like parting speech to them. It's the last thing that he does, and so he calls them, he rallies the whole nation, and he reminds them who the Lord is and what he has done, and then he calls them to a decision again. Now have a look with me at verse 14. We're just going to read these two verses for now. It says, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If there's only one thing you remember from this morning, only one phrase that bumps around in your head throughout the coming week, it's that last bit of verse 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want us to dive in here and look at four things that we can learn uh, from this passage. It's a family Sunday when, when Justin asked me to come and speak. He said, look, you're gonna be speaking to everyone. The kids are there, it's a family thing. Speak to the families. And so I'm gonna speak to the families, but as you'll see, uh, I'm not just speaking to the families. I don't think that the Bible speaks just to the nuclear family, mom, dad, kids. That's almost an anomaly in South Africa these days. And I think Joshua calls the whole nation together. He's eyeballing them and God is asking them as a collective to make a decision to respond to him. So whether you feel like you belong on family service, whether you have a kid or know a kid, this message is for you this morning. The first thing that we can learn from this is this, that Joshua knows that everybody worships something. Joshua knows that everyone worships something. He knows this because he understands that men and women are created in the image of God. God has made you a worshiper. Every single person in this room is a worshiper. You're a worshiper by your nature, how God has made you. And that's what the scriptures tell us, that you're either gonna worship God or you're gonna find something else to worship. You're gonna replace the worship of God with the worship of something else. And living in Johannesburg, we are awash with options of what to worship. The Bible uses different uh, phrases and terminology to describe alternative uh, things of worship. It calls it idolatry a lot of the time. We have idols that we have, that some of them are external, some of them are internal, that we take and we replace the worship of God with. Think with me about some of them. Some of them you may be very familiar with. Some of them you don't even know that you're worshiping them. We're blinded to our own worship of idols. And you know that you have an idol, you can tease out it. You can tease out what the idol is by asking yourself the question, well, how would I respond if that was taken away from me? Would it cause me to collapse? Would it cause me great stress? Think about your wealth. Imagine all that just evaporated. Think about your comfort. We live in the northern suburbs of Johannesburg. This is a comfort addicted part of the world. Everyone here is addicted to comfort, to safety. There are many, many South Africans I know, some of you, I don't wanna, I'm not here to stand on your toes and stuff. Many of them are updating their visas, passports, they are bailing, they are leaving, they're packing for Perth because their comfort has been disturbed already and they've hit their ex exit already, they're gone. They're not interested in what's happening in South Africa, comfort levels have become starting to stress them out, they're gone. Because they worship the God of comfort rather than the God of the Bible. Now I'm not saying if you emigrate it means you're not a Christian, don't like misquote me and send me rude emails and stuff like that, I won't read them. Um, I'll send them to Ndaba. 
Uh, he can read them. You understand what I'm saying? If you're addicted to comfort, some mean messes with that, you need to find another place to go and worship that. Some of us worship power and prestige and position, so you're burying yourself at work so you can keep going up, 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 up. If that was to be taken away, your whole world would fall apart. Some parents worship their children. If anything happened to one of their children, their life would fall apart. It's often good things that we move into God's position. They're not always bad things. That's where it gets messy. They're good things. We just stick them in God's place. And a passage like this in Joshua calls us back into putting Jesus right in the center and saying God is a jealous God and he commands soul worship. He's not interested in being diluted with other idolatries and other gods. He wants us all for himself. But Joshua knows that the people will worship something. And there he gives them the options. Hmm? You saw it there in the text there. He says, look, you can either worship the gods of our forefathers. You can wind your minds back, find an archaic old deity to worship. Or you can worship the gods of the Amorites, the people that we find ourselves amongst. They've obviously got some kind of gods that they were worshiping. He says, or you can worship the God of the Bible, the God of the scriptures who's revealed himself to you. You can choose, but he knows that they're going to worship something. My friends, you are worshiping something this morning. Do you know what it is? Do you know what your heart rushes to worship? Because it's not God alone. It's not God alone. I hate to disabuse you of the notion that you may think you're a wholehearted worshiper, but there is no such thing. There's no such thing as a wholehearted worship of God. All of us, even on your very best day, there's a bit of a mix. Other idols creep in there. John Calvin, a famous theologian, said, our hearts are idol factories. They just keep producing idols. They just keep producing other things to worship other than the true and living God. Tim Keller's a pastor in New York and he paraphrased somebody else. He said, idols always break the hearts of their worshipers. It's gonna give you something for a while and then it's gonna break your heart. It will because it wasn't designed to bear the weight of your worship, and the weight of your soul's needs. Only God alone is designed to do that. And as soon as you put something else in God's place, it'll give you something for a while and eventually it'll crush you. That's what idolatry does. Joseph, no, Joseph doesn't know anything. Joshua knows that they will worship something. Second thing that you see here and that we can learn from this is that their future choice is dependent on them looking backwards. He's asking them to make a decision about the future by looking backwards. Where we dived into the passage there is at the end of a section where Joshua has been recounting to them all of the things that God has done for them as a people. He, he, it's, a, it's a long list of how he's displayed his power, how he's rescued them, how he has defended them, how he has liberated them, how he's done this and done this and, and not allowed this to come to them. And he's provided for them in this way. And he's shown himself to be faithful, faithful, faithful through all of these things. He's asking them to choose, but he's not asking them to choose without any information. He's saying, Think backwards as you make a decision about how you're going to continue to live and who you're going to choose this day. There is a, a word that you see in the scriptures again and again and again and again. And there's good reason for it. It's the word remember. You know why it's there so much? Because you and I have spiritual amnesia. We forget what God is doing in our lives on a month to month basis. What was God doing in your life one year ago? Do you remember? Most, most of you may struggle, I mean, what was the sermon on last week? Okay, well, I know that Oku preached last week, so maybe you remember, maybe you remember that sermon uh, more than other ones, that's a bad example, but uh, if he was preaching on what I thought he was preaching on, you would probably remember it, it would be good for you. Uncom yeah, good. It's good to be discomforted sometimes. But what, what, what has God been doing in the last months and years? We don't remember the faithfulness of God month by month, year by year. Some of you, it's decade by decade. 
remember, remember when you make a decision tomorrow morning to wake up and follow Jesus again in faithful obedience, you're not making a decision in a vacuum. You're making it by looking backwards and saying, he's been exactly the same God every single day all the way through my life. And tomorrow I get to trust him again. That's what he's like. That's what Joshua is provoking them with. He's saying, this is God, he doesn't change. There's no changing in God. He's always the same, he's always faithful. He is always with you. My eyes catching some of you here. Some of you have known me, I think, almost as long as I've been alive, which is an increasingly long period of time, sadly. And I, and I know some of you, and I've known some of you for ages, and I know that some of you have been through wonderful ups and really heartbreaking lows. Some of the valleys are long, and they're very dark. That's what happens in life. Life is tough and it comes at you fast and it's not all pleasant, is it? Sometimes it feels like it's just gonna overwhelm you and crush you. And if you're too young, you don't understand that yet. Some of you understand that and you're too young to have hit that reality already. Life is tough. Valleys are dark and lonely. But you know what, there's one thing that I'm increasingly aware of that's 100% true? That there isn't one single day in your life where God has left you alone. Not one minute of one day of your life has God's face not been fixed on you. And his hands been around you in his care. And he's comforted and he's protected and he has loved and he has provided. He has been faithful, faithful, faithful every single day of your life, whether or not you knew it, whether or not you felt it. And he is not changing that tomorrow. He will not change for all eternity. That is God. There is no one like him. That's what he says. Who are you going to compare me to? Who is my equal? No one. There is no one like the Lord. Your family can bail on you. Your friends can bail on you. Your whole support system can evaporate. God is there with you in the midst of the darkest darkness. And his face is towards you and he is for you. And Joshua reminds them of this. It hadn't all been easy for Israel and he calls them to a choice on this day and he says, as you choose, remember who he is and what he has done for you. He is the one in in whom all the power resides. You can trust him, I would choose him. But have a look at these other gods and make a choice here. He's giving them a choice. The third thing that we can see here is that there's a picture of the gospel. It's beautiful. There's a picture of the gospel here in this this calling of Joshua to the people. Joshua says to them, as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. And you know what the people say? For sure, we are with you. We're on team Joshua. Whole nation, we're in, let's go, yes, please. I mean, they don't exactly say that. It's like a paraphrase kind of thing. But they're like, yes, please, to a person. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what he says to them? Well, let me read it to you. Verse 19, Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. For he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. The people are all like, yes, we're gonna follow, come on. And he just says, no, you are not able to serve the Lord. I mean, he could have had a side gig as a motivational speaker. Imagine how that just sucked out the, the energy and this is like nation building moment and they're like yeah and he's like no it's not gonna happen I know you Oaks it's not gonna happen and you know what he's not a prophet but he is if you know the story that's exactly how it goes and they leave the Lord and they don't follow like they should and they turn away and God's judgment does rest on them but there's a picture of the gospel in here isn't there how many times have you over promised and under delivered before the Lord. 
How many times have you said to God, I will never ever do that again and you've done it the next week? How many unfulfilled promises, unfulfilled things are there in your life, in your relationship with God? You're a half-hearted worshiper of Jesus Christ on your very best day. And that leaves you in need of a rescuer and a savior. And that's really good news. Because God knows what's in the heart of man. And he knew that we would be like this. We would be at best half-hearted worshipers. And so you know what he did? He comes and he inserts himself into the human story. And he comes in the presence of a man, Jesus Christ, and he perfectly lives out an obedient life in your place because you were unable to do it every single, he serves the Lord perfectly, never ever puts a foot wrong. And then he dies on a cross to bear the punishment for those who didn't do it correctly like us. And in his resurrection, he offers life and he imparts that gift and that perfect obedience gets put against your account and he takes your failings on himself. And he offers you life in his name. That is the message of the gospel. You need a rescuer, you need a savior today and you're gonna need one every single day that God gives you breath because you are at best a half-hearted worshiper dabbling around with other idols and unable to fully and completely obey the call that God has placed on your life. But thanks be to God that he has done that. And it should cause you just to marvel at him that God would treat your disobedience with such kindness. That he would treat your love for other things with such patience and call you and welcome you, call you a son and daughter, welcome you in to be with him forever when we have at best really been flimsy worshipers. We promise, we're like, yes, Lord, and we're gonna do it again today. I'm gonna provoke you towards a decision today and you know what, tomorrow, by this afternoon, you will have wandered away from faithfulness to that and you're gonna have to lift your eyes and say, God, you cover this. Your grace covers my disobedience. There's mercy, mercy, mercy that you just live drenched in because of the kindness of God. The fourth thing that we see here is the priority of discipling children. The priority of discipling children. Flip forward a couple pages to Judges chapter two. It's just a few pages along. Have a look at how the story keeps uh, unfolding or unraveling, maybe I should say. Judges chapter two from verse seven. It says, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. Jump to verse 10. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, they died. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. What happened? It says there, all of those who were there on that decision day, yeah, yeah, it says they did follow the Lord. They did. But what happened? Within one generation, a generation rose up who didn't know the Lord and wholeheartedly abandoned him. And you see the rest of the story of the Old Testament is that just playing itself out until Jesus comes in the New Testament. What happened from one generation who were like, yes, we will follow you, we are all yours, as for us and our houses, we will serve the Lord, to another generation who grew up know nothing of the Lord. If you're a mom or a dad, if you're a parent or a grandparent, please listen to me carefully now. Or if you have any significant investment or access into a child's life, please pay careful attention. That is the highest and holiest calling that God has given to you in your life, is to pass on the knowledge of the Lord to the next generation. I'm gonna say it again. That is the highest and holiest calling God has given you is to pass on the knowledge of the Lord to the next generation. Let it not be said of our generation that a generation came up after us that didn't know the Lord. And let me tell you, my life is chaos sometimes. I have three children, they're youngish, pre-teenagers. I mean, you have a pre-teenager in your house. It's like, you walk around like this. I hope she doesn't watch this video. She will one day and then she'll sulk with me until I, you know, 
I'll suspend her phone. I'll do something like that. I don't know. I'll get back at her. My life feels like chaos sometimes because your life will feel like chaos. If you're a parent, welcome to family chaos. There's nothing exceptional about your family. Parenting, especially young children, it's wild. Okay, those of you who've got teenagers, well done for getting here this morning. Even if you've got young kids, well done for rocking up at church. I'm genuinely serious about this. Well done for getting here, even if your mind is a million miles away. You're here and your kids are here. First step. Life is hectic. But listen to me, in Joburg, this time of history, we can't afford to get distracted. We can't take our eyes off the ball. Moms, dads, if you're working, please, I want to plead with you. Do not give your best energy to the people that pay you and give your, your dregs, your leftovers, to the children whose eternities God has called you to shape. Prioritize your life. Engineer your life so that your children get the best of you. Love them. Disciple them. Pour into them. Teach them the fear of the Lord. If you don't know how to do that, find somebody who can teach you and help you to do that. There's never been more resources and available help to help parents to do that. It's a hard thing. It's not a resource thing. If you're a grandparent, I want to provoke you and, and encourage you and to, that you commit yourself to pouring your life into your grandchildren as much as you have access to. I know it gets complicated. Praying for them that they would grow up with the knowledge of the Lord. Parents said, you can, you can win at work, but if you lose at home, you lose everything. Are you with me? You win at work. If you lose at home, you lose everything. Everyone will celebrate you now for what you give your time to. Eternity will celebrate you for the investment you make in the next generation, allowing them to come up and grow up in the fear and the knowledge of the Lord. This is a high and holy thing. I hope you feel provoked. If you feel convicted, that's also fine. It's a decision day. If you're doing nothing with your kids or with your grandparents, con confess that to the Lord and repent and say, God, by your grace, but tomorrow, in the power and the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm gonna start somewhere with my kids. I'm gonna teach them something of the scriptures. I'm gonna teach them something of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. It's not gonna be on me that my kids grow up without any knowledge of God. Repent of your of your apathy in this area and commit yourself with God's grace to giving your best to your children that they would grow up to know and love and savor the wonder of who Jesus Christ is. As we close, I know this, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Some people think it's just like a family verse, like you give it to people when they move house, like on a wooden block and they put it up near the front door and it's like, when you come to our home, here we serve the Lord, you know? But if you, if you don't have kids in the house or you, you know, renting somewhere or you're older, like you're exempt from this. Like if you thankfully dodge that bullet, especially if you're single, it's like, wow, phew, I managed to duck the having to serve the Lord thing because I don't have a house and whatever else and me and my family. Joshua summons the entire nation here. So there isn't a single person in this room this morning who Joshua, as it were, and the Lord is speaking through, saying, you're off the hook. You don't have to make a choice about whether you're going to serve and worship the Lord. You have to choose. I want to re remind you, you get to choose. Joshua put it before the people, said, you can choose. Pick a God you want to choose. As for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. And I think Joshua had given them really good reasons for it. If you're a standard nuclear kind of family that's in, increasingly in the minority, mom, dad, kids, whatever, I want to ask you as parents, as kids, kids, listen to me, boys and girls, here's what you need to do today. Before today finishes, I want you to sit down with your parent, mom, dad, both of them, whatever the situation is, you need to ask them this question. Mom, dad, whoever you are, whatever is going on here, what is our plan as a family to serve and worship the Lord? You guys run this uh, place? Uh, I want to know, what is our family's plan what is our family's plan to love and to serve and to worship the Lord? Boys and girls, you promise me you'll do that? Good. There are going to be some interesting lunches going down around Joburg today. Wonderful. 
Parents, you gotta, you gotta get on the same page and help your kids understand what it looks like because it's gonna look different in every context for every family. It's gonna look different for all of you, but you gotta have a plan. Hey, family, this is what it looks like for us to serve the Lord. Some of you are single parents. It's easily the toughest thing to be. You have so many demands on your time and constraints on your freedom and stuff, but you're not exempt. How are you going to answer that question today? What does it look like for you to love and to serve the Lord? You've got to answer that question. You've got to choose again. Some of you are young married. You don't have kids yet. Maybe you're waiting for the kids. Maybe you don't want the kids. Maybe the kids won't come. I don't know. What does it look like for you now to love and to serve the Lord? What does it look like for you to worship Him? You've got more time now. When the kids come, stuff gets more complicated. What does it look like now? If you're single and you're here this morning, you're in this as well. You know what one thing we've got wrong as a church? Not this church, the church, is we've said family is better than single. We said, we said we have family day. Is this the family service? I think it's family day. I don't know if you have single day. I'm not judging. I don't think, I don't know of any church, so I'm not not raining on the parade here. No, I've never been to a church that, it's singles day. They're like, no one would come. They'd be like, oh, shish. <laughs> I'm away for the weekend. And nobody wants to be on Singles Day. Have you read this book? The Son of God came as what? Yeah, a single. Paul says what? It's better if you don't get married. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, yeah, he was right. I should have. <laughs> should have listened. <laughs> it's too late. Sorry for you. Stick it out. <laughs> yes, the Bible celebrates singleness in a way, as a church, we've moved it onto the back seat. If you're single here this morning, you are the only one in your house, so you answer for yourself. As for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. You've got time. You may have resource. What is it going to look like for you as a single person to love and to serve and to worship the Lord? Some of you are empty nesters. You've either kicked your kids out the house or they've left. You've got some time. Maybe you're just recovering from the years of parenting. What are you going to do? How are you going to answer this? What is it going to look like for you to love and to serve the Lord? Some of you have got gray hair. Some of you have got no hair. I'm uh, rapidly catching you guys. The gray heads, if you have gray hair or no hair, listen to me quickly. You are not done. You're not exempt from this. You don't get to not answer this question. I felt strongly provoked in preparing for this. And and the one thing that I love about this church is that you have some older people here. At Parkhurst, it's very, very young. I'm old at Parkhurst. Uh, And I love just, I love having gray heads here again this morning. I want to remind you if you are older in the Lord, God is not done with you yet. Not by a long shot. And some of you, your most fruitful years are still coming. They're still coming. Because you know the Lord. You have not years of understanding the faithfulness of God. You have decades of understanding His faithfulness. You have so much to give to God's people. I want to encourage you today. You answer this question. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It may just be you. You may have outlived your partner. I know in this church there's widows. There's divorcees. God is not done with you. God's not done with you. You're not second rate in the family of God. Maybe still working through heartache and pain and stuff. God understands that. God sees that. You still have to answer the question. Will you choose him? Will you follow him? What will it look like for you in your house to love and to serve the Lord? God is not done with you yet. I said it at the eight o'clock service this morning. I don't think many of them were here. Rosehaven is a place of dynamite for the kingdom of God. I know that some of the success we've had at Parkhurst is because there have been people at Rosehaven who've known me, who taught me Sunday school, who've been praying for me on a week-to-week basis in Parkhurst. And we're seeing people come to faith in Jesus because there's an army of people out there. They can't get out often. Their strength isn't what it used to be. But man, they know how to fight and pray and bring heaven to earth. They're an army. 
in an army. If you are older, you are not done until God calls you to himself. And I want to encourage you and provoke you to get going again this morning. And give yourself to what really matters. Lowering your handicap does not matter. Give yourself to the things of God. You are the most effective warriors in the kingdom. Commit yourself afresh to that. The last people I want to speak to is those who've made up proper and complete stuff up. You know, some of you, you got divorced because, and it was because of you. It's because of you. Now, some of you are sitting here, you've committed atrocious things, your life is a mess. If you front it up and you're honest about it, your life is actually a mess. And you're distracted, yeah, you, well, you, you think you're congratulating yourself for getting here, and we congratulate you as well, but you're not in any, you don't feel in any place, uh, place or space to give or be effective for God. I want to say to you as well, there's grace that's sufficient for you. And God is not done with you yet. You may have had a wipeout back down the road. It doesn't disqualify you. It doesn't disqualify from you from being effective in the kingdom of God. God is not finished with you. The power of the Spirit is available to you. You still have to answer the question, how will you serve the Lord? Will you or won't you? And I want to encourage you today to look to him to look to him and to say, God, I'm, I'm signing up for that. Absolutely. You can see the mess that my life is. You can see what, how I've tried to sabotage it, the foolish decisions I've made, whatever it is. You're not kicked off the team. God doesn't have an A and a B team. He only has children. And he's inviting you and he's calling you and he's provoking you again to sign up, to serve him, to love him, and to worship him. At Parkhurst, we often ask people to stand as a sign of response. Uh, I don't know what you guys do here anymore. I haven't been around much. But I want to encourage you this morning. You don't have to. And I don't want you to feel weird peer pressure or like the person next to me is standing and I feel awkward. What if somebody looks at me and thinks I'm not making a commitment? But this is a decision day. This is a, it's a decision day. Just like Joshua eyeballed the people, I'm standing in front of you and I'm asking you the question, who are you going to serve? Who will you worship? Who will you give your, the best of your heart to? Will it be the Lord? Will you sign up and say, me and my house, we are going hard after God. It's going to look different for us, everybody else, but we're saying again, today we choose you, God. In the light of your astounding faithfulness, your amazing power, your goodness to us, I'm choosing you again and again and again. And by your grace, we're going to do this every single day until you either call for us or you come and fetch us. And if that's you and you'd like to show that as an outer demonstration, if you're a parent, you've got your kids with you, stand with your kids if you want. Grab them, hold them, pull them close. Put your hand on your head so you can bless them as I pray for us. But if that's you, if you want to stand, I'm going to pray for us now before Ndaba comes to close it out. If you'd like to stand, you're welcome to join with me. Father, we, we love you, and yet we are more grateful this morning that you love us. We want to worship you as the grace-giving Father this morning. We want to worship you, Jesus, as the resurrection and the life, as the one and only true God who loves us and has made us new and given us meaning and purpose, who's lavished love and grace over us. Thank you, Father, a thousand times for the immeasurable kindness you have lavished over our lives. And as we stand before you this morning, we want to say like the people of Israel did in front of Joshua, as for us and for our households, we will serve the Lord. We will worship you. We choose you again this morning, Father. And yet we acknowledge at the same time, Father, you know us. You know the waywardness of our hearts. You know that on our best days, we are half-hearted worshipers. And we thank you that, Jesus, you have covered that sin on the cross. You have removed that from us. You have forgiven us for our apathy in worship. 
and we pray that you would capture our hearts in new ways again this morning. That in each one of our homes and our families, we would be found to be people who love you and worship you. And you'd give us creative ways to see how that plays itself out. But I pray for these people this morning, and I pray for this church, that Father, you would be glorified in new ways, that many would come to faith because there's families and people and units here who live abandoned to the glory and the fame of Jesus Christ. And who say, we choose you. We choose you again. Would you please now, Father, fill us with the strength and the help and the power of the Holy Spirit to love you and to walk in ways of obedience before you every day that you give us breath. And we ask it together as God's people in Jesus' name. Amen.